open up our Bibles to the book of Matthew. Today we're going to be covering a few verses, uh, uh, verses 17 through 19. <laughs> um, as you're turning your Bibles there, uh, it was funny because this morning uh, I was half asleep, believe it or not. And I must have prayed like four times before I even read the, the passage. And I was like, oh my goodness, we're not doing that. But anyways, um, I'm awake now. Um, just got a quick thing to remind you guys, please, if you guys, uh, we encourage you guys, uh, Calvary Chapel Chino Hills with Jack Hibbs. They, um, they, uh, they, they're working on this, this um, petition to keep women using women's restroom and men using men's restroom with the whole, you know, uh, same-sex marriage law that went through. Now other laws are starting to change. And we're trying, you know, as Christians to make our voices uh, be heard, you know, um, that we want to keep things, you know, the right way. So we encourage you guys to sign the petition uh, if, if you could. Um, at, right here at the table in our, in, our, in our fellowship hall, we have these petitions. We'd really appreciate it if you can get that done today. Um, next week is our baptism. So I'm excited about that. Guys, just show up. We'll have the address for you guys on Wednesday. Uh, we're going to have a barbecue. You don't have to worry about bringing anything. Just come. Uh, uh, everything has been provided for. The Lord's going to, you know, take care of you guys. But and then we're going to baptize those that want to get baptized. So, again, uh, we encourage you guys to come out if you're not doing anything that day. I know that the harvest is that weekend. You know, maybe you guys can go uh, Friday, you know what I'm saying, and then come to the baptism, or you can go after the baptism. We're not going to be there all, all, all night as we've done before. So I encourage you guys to come out and just have a great time. Uh, the earlier you come, the more you can hang out and fellowship. If you come late, then you're going to get better than go. So, you know, that's not cool. So I encourage you guys to come out. It's going to be a great time. And also, if you know someone who doesn't know the Lord, and I'm sure you do, you know, Harvest Crusades, man. Greg Glory, you know, he's a, way, uh, a great communicator of the Word of God, especially when it comes to just uh, preaching the gospel, man. Um, he has something prepared for, for the lost. Uh, but then at the same time, man, he has Phil Wickham on all three nights. If you guys know who Phil Wickham is, um, some of the songs that we sing here are from Phil Wickham. And that guy can get down, man. So, man, I'm excited to see him. Uh, we also have Lecrae on Saturday night. Le Lecrae is a, is a, it's a, it's a rapper. You guys into hip hop and stuff. He'll be there on Saturday night. I know I'm going to that one. So um, hopefully you guys can make it out there and just um, have a great time. Anyways, we're in Matthew chapter 20. Um, I entitled this message, The Instrument of Life. And I'm, I'll share with you at the end why I entitled it, The Instrument of Life. Um, but let's go ahead and read together. If you will please stand and join me. And as we read through Matthew chapter 20, verse 17. This is what Matthew rec uh, records for us as Jesus predicts his death the third time. Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to, to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And the third day, he will rise again. Lord, as we get into these parts of Scripture, we know that these type of verses, Lord, um, are heavily used during Passion Week. But Lord, today we've come across in our study through Matthew uh, to a part in which we know it's important. So important, Lord God, that even your son told the disciples to behold as he tried to capture their attention to what was going to be said. May we, Lord God, be captured to the, to the important message that your son shares here, which is our means for salvation. May it be a reminder to us for those who are saved, it may be, a, it may be a, a hook to those that are not saved to be brought into your presence. Speak to our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name we say, amen. You can have a seat. So Jesus was in Galilee, and he, may, and he, and he decided, to, and actually he actually started going down to Jerusalem. And I keep reminding you guys because I want you guys to just be informed of what is taking place. We know that these are the last days of Jesus' life on earth or ministry on earth. Um, and he's heading towards the cross. Uh, in fact, he's already shared to his disciples. And in, in actually in um, Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, 
He already told them that he was going to go to Jerusalem and he was going to be killed. And on the third day, he will rise from the dead. And then again, he shared it at Matthew chapter 17, verses 22 to 23, that, you know, he was going to die and be resurrected on the third day. This is the third time that Jesus reminds his, um, his followers. But, but we do know that as he's making his way, he has stopped in very uh, many villages to minister, both, you know, physically to, you know, touch the, those that were, that were, that were sick or, or lame or blind, and, and he would touch them and they would be healed. But we also know that he was ministering God's truth and, and, and their spiritual, uh, the spiritual part of them were being healed as well. Now, during that time, we saw how he also confronted a rich young ruler. And we saw how the rich young ruler could not, could not let go of those things that were so dear to him. And because of it, what he thought he desired, eternal life, he couldn't obtain it because he had too much. And, and because of that, you know, the disciples kind of turned to the Lord and said, Lord, then who can be saved? And Jesus said, listen, it's impossible with man. In other words, with man's efforts and man's riches, there's no way they can be saved. It has to be a, a work of the Lord. And that's why he tells us with God, things, you know, all things are possible regarding salvation. But with man, it's impossible, right? So right after that, Jesus then gave to them a parable. He gave to him a parable because in verse 27, Peter asked the question. He says, see, we have left everything basically to follow you. Then he says, therefore, what shall we have, right? He goes, he wants to know what is he going to obtain, you know, because of what they've done. They've left everything, you know, and they went and followed Christ. And Jesus gives him a parable. And um, actually in verse 28, he just breaks it down and, and tells them how they're going to be blessed when they enter into eternity. Now, even though the 12 disciples have a special reward for them when entering heaven, he still tells them, listen, you're still going to have e eternal life. But if you, le if you left people or relationships and stuff for his sake, he tells them, listen, your reward is going to be a hundredfold. And we talked about all that and so forth. And then in verse 30, Jesus said this, but many who are first will be last and last will be first. Kind of like to correct Peter there because he's kind of a little bit getting ahead of himself. And then he gives a parable. And in this parable, we know that in, uh, he's dealing with salvation, how salvation and all the spiritual blessings that come with salvation uh, go basically equally to all of believers. Now, last time we were together, I kind of talked about, I talked about how all of us receive those blessings, right? You know, of salvation, forgiveness, eternal life, and so forth. And then I talked about how there's also rewards for those that are faithful in the service of God. So we spend a lot of time developing that. And so in chapter 20 from verses 1 all the way down to 16, he gives it, he gives that illustration, this heavenly illustration, I mean this earthly illustration with a heavenly truth to get the disciples to understand. Now, in verse 17, Jesus now continues on to Jerusalem. And that's what we picked up. He says, now Jesus going to Jerusalem took the 12 disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be tra uh, betrayed uh, to the chief priests and to the scribes. And we'll stop there. We'll go back, and then we'll, we'll get back to that, the other part of that verse in a moment. But we do know that Jesus continues on with his journey to Jerusalem. So Matthew tells us that, G that Jesus here predicts also, as we just read, his death for the third time, his burial and his resurrection. Now, it's interesting to note that when Jesus is going, I want you to keep in mind that there's a crowd of people following him. Since the time he was in Galilee, when, when he left Jerusalem, made his way to Galilee, and now coming back to Jerusalem to be killed, you know, to, to fulfill God's plan of redemptive, of, to redeem mankind, we know that there's always been this crowd of people following him. Remember that? To the point where Jesus will have to stop and minister to them and even bless them. Remember when he fed the 5,000 and so forth? So everywhere Jesus went, there was a crowd of people. Now, when they're coming back, I am sure that there's more people following them. Well, keep in mind that Jesus dies within the, 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 day, the day of Passover, right? So, so there are people traveling, even from where Jesus was coming, down to Jerusalem. They were traveling south to make it to Jerusalem. So amongst these crowds of people, right, as Jesus is going, right, there's the disciples with them as well. And as they're going uh, with the Lord, the Lord puts them aside and says, listen, we're going to Jerusalem, notice. We are going to go to Jerusalem. And then he says, but me, guess what? The Son of Man, the Messiah, is going to be killed, but not before suffering persecution under the hands of, of wicked men. And, and we're going to talk about that today. In fact, um, you know, um, as I was preparing this message, I actually want to do um, chapter 17 all the way to chapter uh, 28. And, and to be honest with you, um, 
um, I stopped and I just read, you know, these three verses. And, and I just kind of put my Bible aside for a moment and I just began to think. I began to think about what Jesus did and what he was saying here. And, and to be honest with you guys, I was, I was captivated once again. As I, as, as I go back and I, and I reflect upon Jesus' ministry here on earth. Now, when we think of Christ, you know, we think of all the good things. And of course, you should, right? We, we start thinking of him when he was a baby in the manger. We think how the, the three wise guys came and, and gave him presents. And, we, you know, we, all those stories, how he walked on water, how he healed the sick. And, man, everything was, was, was good, right? But, but, but sometimes when we get, when we're reading through the Gospels, it's not until we get to the end of the Gospels that we kind of realize, man, this is the true reason why Jesus came. To die for the sins of the world. So when I was, you know, kind of reminiscing on, on, the, on those particular verses, you know, I, I, as I mentioned, my heart was being captivated by the message of the gospel. And, and I said, Lord, man, you know what? You know, help me to put something together, Lord, that I might be able to give your people so they too can be reminded of what Jesus did for them. So today we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what Jesus is saying here regarding what he has to go through. So again, he turns to the disciples amongst the crowds, right? And he reminds them of the divine plan. Again, I want you to notice how, how uh, Jesus tells them, you know, he, he says, behold. Now the word behold there was simply a common exclamation. It was a means of calling special attention to something very important. So once he has their attention, Jesus then tells them that they are going to Jerusalem. Now, I find this interesting, guys. And, and as I was reading this, this is going to bless my heart. Hopefully it will bless you. But I want you to notice how Jesus had to take the disciples away from the distraction so that he can speak to them God's plans, to speak to them God's truths. And as I was reading this, the Lord began to speak to my heart and, and, and began to share with me how God so desperately wants to kind of put us aside from all the distraction in this world so that he can reveal his plans and his truths to us because see what i what i what i've come to know today is how today the enemy has used so many things to keep us right from knowing what god's plans are in our lives the enemy has is striving today right to in fact he's not even trying that hard man he just does something a little simple and they're like you know following after whatever entertainment they might be whatever 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 it might it is to not get into the word of god so that god can speak to us See, see, God wants to take some of us aside and say, well, actually all of us, and say, listen, this is what I want to share with you. I want to reveal to you my purpose to you. I, I, I want to teach you my truth. I want to get to know you. No, matter of fact, I want you to get to know me. And also to share with you what I have in store for you if you just walk with me. But today a lot of Christians are not taking that opportunity to sit at the Lord's feet and to hear from him. They're so distracted, as I mentioned. They're caught up with the wave of people and what they're doing. See, these people were on their way to Jerusalem to celebrate, the, to, to partake in this feast. And in that celebration, they don't realize, some of them probably didn't realize that Jesus was among them. And yet Jesus calls out to his 12 and they listen. And they obey when, when Jesus calls them to the side. And he begins to share with them God's divine plan. Guys, listen. The Bible says that we are to be still and to know that He is God. You find that in the book of Psalms. That He is God. You know, if we would just turn off our TVs, right? And I can say this a hundred times and you guys still won't do it. So I'm going to say it again until you do it. You can turn off your radios. Stop thinking so much of work. You know, Find a place to just meet with the Lord. You know, the other day, um, actually yesterday, uh, there was a brother that uh, I saw on Facebook, man, and, and, and he was at the beach just, he, you know, with his Bible. And, and, you know, just right there, he says, just here this early morning, just, just trying to get into the Word. And I said, man, can you imagine if more Christians do that? I said, yeah, Pastor, but I don't have a car to go to the beach. And get a pool and go to the backyard and just relax, even if it's the small ones, man. That's cool. What I'm saying is that just make time for Christ. 
Because I'm telling you right now, just like Jesus called his to his disciples, he's calling some of us just to sit, to put things aside, get away from all the distractions, get away from the entertainment, get away from the sports, get away from job, get away from the responsibility of the family, and just listen to what God wants to say to you. You know, um, I try to do that, you know, every morning. I do. And I do it in the morning, and the reason why, because once I wake up, it's hard for me to, to do that. So I say, okay, Lord, you know what, I'm going to discipline myself. Get up to pray and to get into your word. And you know something, guys? It sets. It sets my day. It, it does. It, 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 for those who are on a diet, you know what I'm talking about, right? You know, I just started running with my wife early in the morning. You know, uh, we try to get up. Oh, oh, actually, we went like a few couple times, but we're trying. But I tell her, isn't it cool because when we run, it, you know, because you, you worked out, you say, you know what, I don't want to eat that because I worked out in the morning type of thing. Then, then, then if you go work, in, work out in the night because then now, you, now you're working out what you ate and you know what I'm saying. So, 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 but what we do is it sets, it sets the pace for my day. You say, you know what, I'm not going to eat this junk food because I still do. But anyway, but in my mind I make these plans, right? I'm not going to eat this. I'm not going to eat this. I'm not going to eat this because I worked out, you know, type of thing. Well, same thing with God. When you get up early in the morning, and eat the spiritual bread of God's word. It sets your day. And you know, guys, I found that that's the best time for you to talk to God. And don't be afraid. You're not waking him up. He is awake. He doesn't sleep. In fact, he's probably right there waiting for you. Like, you're up? Yeah, yeah, yeah Lord. Cool, let's talk. But, but, but find those times to be able to, um, to listen to what Jesus has to say to you. Bible says in Jeremiah 29 11 that he knows the, the plans that he has towards you say his Lord. He says that of a hope and a future. There's some of you guys are probably saying man I never heard that before. It's because you're not taking yourself away from the distraction of this world. To listen to what God has for you. He has a plan. He has a future. He's someone who wants to bless you if you would just take the time to go to a side and spend it with the Lord. Wherever it is Spend some time with Christ. In verse 18, he says, Behold, we are going to Jerusalem. Notice he tells the disciples that they're going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed. In Mark's gospel, turn your Bibles there right quickly. In Mark chapter 10, we have Mark's account, and he gives us just a little bit more detail of what happened that day as they were making their way into Jerusalem. And in Mac, Mac I'm thinking Big Macs, that's why. No, I'm not. Mark chapter 10. I don't like Big Macs. Mark chapter 10 in verse 32. Notice. It says, Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus was going before them. So notice. Jesus is in front of them leading the way. And they were amazed. Notice that. I would underscore that for a moment, and I'm going to tell you something about that word. And as they followed, they were afraid. Then he took the twelve aside and again began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Now, the word amazed there, notice that, in the Greek simply refers to a, a, to an, a great astonishment or a bewilderment. And, but, but sometimes the Greek word carries the idea of, quote, immobility because of fright. It speaks of a complete inability to correctly comprehend and react to an idea or an event. Now, the reason why I emphasize that is because I want you to know that Jesus up to this point has been with the disciples for almost three years. And they have witnessed Jesus' powers and have heard his, his powerful and authoritative teachings. And, and to the point where, where they, they were convinced that he was the Messiah that they left everything behind and they placed themselves in, in Jesus' total care. But now, as they're making their way to Jerusalem, everything begins to seem hopeless or pointless. So they couldn't make sense of what has happened. They were probably in disbelief and confused and probably had given up emotionally, if not intellectually, on the idea of Jesus' establishment of his kingdom here on earth. But afraid and all, they follow. They follow. I like Mark's gospel because he tells us that Jesus was in front of them. And that they, were, they couldn't comprehend. 
Remember with me how I shared with you how the disciples were convinced that Jesus was going to establish his kingdom? Even all the way to the end, they, they really believed that Jesus was going to set them free from the control of the Romans at that time. So, so they're following him. They're seeing all these magical things. Not magical, but wonderful, miraculous things that Jesus is doing. And, and they're, they're still hoping, man, you know what I'm saying, type of thing. And they're following the Lord, trusting him. Here's another application I want to give to you guys. Life has its difficulties. Life has all kinds of things that we're, it's like we don't even know, right? There's fears out there. What if this? What if this happens? What if this happens? What if this? And, and we're afraid, right? And because of it, we can't move forward or we can't let go and just trust God, right? Okay, can I encourage you to, to let Jesus lead the way? Can I encourage you, even though you're confused and you don't understand it now, just to trust who Jesus is? Jesus was Messiah, whether the disciples couldn't get it all together yet in their mind. He was the Lord's promised Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah, the one that, 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 that the Old Testament revealed as the ruler, you know, the one who was going to establish his kingdom on earth one day. He was still that person. Even though Jesus was going to obtain all that, and, and we know that late now because we have the scriptures later in the future, and, and we know that up to this point, he's speaking about a rule in the hearts of mankind, but we also understand that, that, that the disciples didn't quite understand the entire plan of God just yet. But Jesus still was that person. Jesus, even though we don't understand him fully, is still Jesus. He's still God. He's still the one you can trust. You can still trust him. When he tells you not to worry, you don't have to worry. You can trust him. When he says, listen, I'm going to take care of you, man. Just look at the little, the little birdies out there and how I feed them. Yeah? Ain't you more valuable than those little birds? What about how, how you, when you see those nice little flowers and how they're, they, they're, they're, how they're dressed? Ain't they beautiful? You're like, yeah. He says, see, I, I got them all taken care of. You're more precious than that. Don't worry about it. You can, you can trust his word because, see, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He never changes. So you can enter into those, through those areas in your life that are scary but not allow the fear to keep you from going forward. You can say, oh, man, this is it, but I'm trusting the Lord. I'm trusting God. Even when you hear things that, oh, man, Lord, that's hard. Well, the disciples were kind of confused a little there. Jesus is leading them to Jerusalem, and I love the fact that they're following him. They're following. And keep in mind that as they're following Jesus, you know, Jesus doesn't have you know, an army behind him. He only has 12 guys. Knuckleheads, too. He, he doesn't have all the things that a king has, so, so he's going to Jerusalem. I wonder if they're wondering, okay, if we're going there, you know, like, how is he going to take over? Like, they're still having got it. That's why Jesus reminds them. Hey, we're going to Jerusalem. I want you to understand that the Son of Man is going to be killed. In a very bad way. And he would be raised the third day. So, in Luke chapter 18, verse 31, we're told that it was the plan of God for Jesus to go to Jerusalem. And the reason why was because when you study the Old Testament, you're going to find that the scripture talk about how Jesus was going to die in Zion, there in Jerusalem. In fact, it says in Luke 18, 31, all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man, will be accomplished or fulfilled. So, Jesus going to Jerusalem, I want you to know, was not an accident. He didn't just know, but foretold those events through his prophets, and now he moves toward the fulfillment. You know, um, the Lord um, gave me something this morning when I was teaching the first, the first service. I asked, I, I was, as I was talking with the body, I said, you know what, guys? I want you to think about this for a moment. Jesus knew about his death. 
He was God. He was omniscient. He knows all things. And yet he still went. He still went. Even though the disciples forgot a little there, he didn't forget. He knew what he had to do. He knew that he was going to die a painful death. In fact, think about it. He's telling them. Notice again. He's telling them, I'm going to be betrayed. Not only that, I'm going to be condemned to death. I'm going to be handed over to the Gentiles, mocked, scourged, and then crucified. He's telling them in detail what's going to happen to him. And yet he's still making his way to Jerusalem. So when I stopped and I thought, I said, think about this. Why would Jesus do that? Why would Jesus go continue on when he knew that it was going to cost him his life? Some of us will be like, I ain't going that way. I'm going this way. You know what? Forget that. But let me tell you why he did it. Very simple. Because he loves you. Because he loves me. He loves us so much that even though he knew he was going to suffer, he still went. Why? Because it was the only means by which man can be saved by. Think about that. That's the only way man can be saved by. Is through the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That is what makes the gospel of Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is the gospel by which we stand and by which we are saved. Death, burial, and the resurrection. That is the most important message that we have ever received. Because if we uh, uh, take that message and we apply it to our lives and we believe it, the Bible says you shall be saved. But salvation came at, at a great expense. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. At a great expense. But the Bible says that the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Everything that had to do with the cross, he endured it. Because of joy. You know who that joy was? You and me. So on the road to the cross, Jesus being God, think about it. He had you and I in mind. He had you and I in mind. And that joy was, and that love is what kept them motivated. Can I say this, guys? For those that are Christians, I want you to learn from the one you follow. I want you to learn how love, how love moved him to faithfulness. His love was his motivation for his faithfulness. Not only to the Father, but to us. And guys, if you love God, if you love Jesus, You can fulfill your purpose in this world. What is the purpose of the Christian? How many of you guys know what it is? No? You guys are afraid to say something and then someone says, no, that's not it. Here's a here. To glorify God. That's the ultimate purpose. Everything else is the means and how to do it. But our main purpose is to glorify God. And the way to glorify God is to fall so in love with him that as you're serving him, regardless of the persecution, regardless of what is said before you, you will fulfill. That's why I tell people, what's the key to Christianity? Falling in love with Jesus. That's simple. Just fall in love with him. And yet we see Jesus still going, knowing all this, he still goes, you know, as a parent, you know, and some of you parents know what I'm talking about. You love your children so much, right? You do everything for them. Everything. You even work two jobs just to make sure that they're taken care of, right? Make sure they got food, they got clothes, and make sure they have money set aside so they can go to college. You sacrifice so much. You don't even think about it. After a while, it becomes normal in your life, and you just do it because you love them so much. You're moved by that love for them that you don't even take into consideration your own life. Well, that's what Jesus did, man. That's what Jesus did. He was so moved by the love that he has for you. He didn't even consider his own life. He's saying, you know, I'm going, I'm going. But before all that, I'm sure he was thinking of us. That's what moved him. He said, I'm going to go, man. He 
Jesus was going to happen to you. He fulfilled his call. But again, in the Old Testament, it was foretold through his prophets. And now Jesus is moving towards that fulfillment. Through Moses, God predicted that Messiah, Messiah's bones would, 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 wouldn't be broken in Exodus 12, 43. Through the psalmist, God predicted that, the, that, the, that on the cross, Jesus, Messiah, will be pierced. Psalms 22, 16. In Psalms 22, 18, the prophets predicted that lots will be cast for his garments. In Psalm 69, 21, the Messiah is said will be given vinegar to drink. Psalms 22, 1, it predicts that the Messiah will cry out in pain. In Psalm 60, 16, verse 10, Messiah would rise from the dead. Psalms 110, verse 1, the Messiah would ascend to heaven. Zacharias did the same thing. Zacharias prophesied that Messiah was going to enter into Jerusalem riding on a colt. Zechariah 9.9. 9. And Jesus fulfilled it. Zechariah 11.12. We're told that Messiah will be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus was betrayed. 30 pieces of silver. And when you keep on reading those verses, you'll find that it's also prophesied that, that Messiah will be deserted by his own friends. And then in Zechariah 12.10, we're told that Messiah will be pierced. Wait, years before crucifixion was ever invented. The whole Old Testament has types and symbols that spoke of Messiah's death. From Adam and Eve's covering that was made out of animal skin. Spoke about the, how God had to sacrifice an animal so he can use the skin to cover their nakedness. Spoke of the sacrifice that would cover our sins. Abraham and Isaac. Remember with him up in the mountain, Moriah? When Abraham was going to sacrifice his son, the Lord intervened. Saw his faithfulness and gave him a ram. And the ram took the place of Isaac, the sacrifice that the son Messiah would die. The Passover is a picture of, of the wrath of God. You see that on all being portrayed in the life of Christ as he was on that cross. And you can just go on and on in scripture. It was predicted. Jesus had to go to Jerusalem to fulfill. Moved by love. Faithfulness to his father. He took the disciples with him. Now notice Jesus then tells them that he will be betrayed to the religious leaders. And they are going to condemn him to death. And he will be you know, turned over to the Gentiles or the Romans where he will be mocked, whipped, and then crucified. Yet on the third day he promises to rise from the dead. So Jesus here omnisciently adds additional details of his suffering and his death to the many prophets, prophecies of the Old Testament. But notice how, again, how he refers to himself as the Son of Man. Notice that. He says the Son of Man will go to Jerusalem or, and be betrayed. When he uses the word the Son of Man or the phrase the Son of Man, I want you to know that it was an Old Testament title that connected the Messiah to Jesus or, or the Messiah to um, to Jesus Christ. He was the God man, the son of man. He tells us as he predicts that he will be betrayed by the religious leaders and we know that it had to do with the scribes and the Pharisees and so forth. You know you know what I trip out on? That all 12 were there. And this is crazy, Judas was there too. We know later on that Judas is the one who betrays Jesus, right? Here's my thing. I thought I was, I was thinking. When Jesus is saying this, was Ju Judas paying attention? Or was he so caught up in his deception? Remember, this is just a few days before he's, he's betrayed. That he can't hear what God is saying. 
And it shows me that there can be people in the presence of God as the word of God is being spoken. And people still can't hear it because they're so caught up in their sin. And ultimately, it's going to lead to their death, just like Judas said. There can be some people right now so deceived in how they're living to the point where they will even hear the words of God and twist it so it can fit their lifestyle. But they're thinking, oh, you know what? Grace, mercy, oh, yeah, yeah. It's going to lead you to your death, ultimately. And, and, and I'm saying this, guys, please don't think I'm trying to condemn you. I'm trying to awaken you to the fact that we can hear the Lord and still continue in our sin life patterns of life and then do something that we can't take back like Judas he committed one of the worst sins ever recorded in this book he betrayed the one who called him friend think about it yet he heard at this moment what was going on and he couldn't hear he was listening but he wasn't hearing or some of that notice to be betrayed by the chief priest he refers to the to the religious leaders of that day he then predicts that he will be condemned to death those that will condemn Jesus to death will be the chief priests and the, the, the scribes if you remember with me they, they, they wanted him crucified when he stood there at Caiaphas' place. You know, I, when I was in Israel just last year, we visited that place. It was the first time I've ever been to that place. And it was kind of crazy because uh, we kind of go in and they kind of fixed it all up and they made it into a shrine now. But, but, but it's crazy because now you're able to take the stairs down to the cells where they will uh, hold the prisoners. And that is the place where it's believed that Jesus was being held by Caiaphas. A little small place few maybe about four three or four cells in there and I can picture the Lord waiting there until they call him up and he goes and he stands before Caiaphas and the religious leaders and then they condemn him to death so Jesus predicted and not only that after he predicted it he said that the Romans that they were going to be given over to the Gentiles notice and they will condemn him to death and then deliver him to the Gentiles to the Romans, there were Gentiles, non-Jews. Because Rome didn't allow subject or allow subject nations to impose a death penalty, the Jewish religious leaders could condemn Jesus to death, but couldn't execute him without the Roman approval. So it was necessary for them to turn him over to the Roman Gentiles in order to carry out their evil plans. So they turned him over to the Romans. And you guys remember that? He stood before who? Pontius Pilate. Finally, he gave, he put him in front of the people and said, what do you want us to do with this man? And what do the Jews say? Crucify him. Crucify him. But before they crucified him, if you remember with me, they first, they, they mocked him and discouraged him. And that's what he says. Notice, the other thing they're going to tell, they're going to do to me. He's telling the disciples this. He says, listen, they're going to mock me, scourge me, and they're going to crucify me. Well, when Jesus talked about those things, they knew exactly what he was talking about. Because at that time, Roman crucifixion was being exercised, and many people, criminals, were being killed. Crucifixion was actually, uh, it, it was, a, it was a, a means in how they, they, they penalized criminals. Kind of like the electric chair. So they knew what he was talking about. Before they crucified them, they would, they would, they would whoop them, they would, they would scorch them. They would beat them. And in the process, Jesus says, they're going to mock me. So again, but Jesus was being held by the Roman authorities. If you study the scriptures, you would know that he was mocked, made fun of. Then he scourged him as the, as the custom was with prisoners who weren't Roman citizens. As the persecution of Jesus began, the B 
obedience began. If you're taking notes, you can jot these down. Matthew 27, 29 to 31. Mark chapter 15, 16 through 20. And John 19, 5 through 9. And what they would do when someone was scourged, they would get a whip, a leather whip in it were sharp pieces of bone and metal with that were embedded to the whip. And they took the Lord, and you guys know, you've seen the passion of the Christ. Let me just give you a brief, a brief uh, picture of what happened. They took him, they tied his, they bond him, tied his hands over a little stone, and they whooped him. They whooped him. This thing was so, so bad, it has been noted that that by, by the first lash, it, it, it would rip his skins wide open. By the second lash, it was already touching the muscle. Third, it was already ripping through the muscle. By the fourth, it was hitting bone. I want you to re remember with me here. Rem be reminded, guys. I want you to think with me. This was Jesus Christ, the lover of our souls. He's being whooped. The penalty was 40 minus one for mercy. When criminals were brought there and they were whooped, the criminal will confess his crime, and then he was given mercy. But Jesus had no crime. He was sinless, without sin. And therefore, he couldn't confess nothing. So he took the whole 39. So by the third or fourth whip, he's already touching bone. You can already imagine that how his skin looked as it looked like ribbons just hanging from his body. Think about it. After they did that, they laughed at him. You know, remember the story. We can read it for yourselves. They took him. They put a, a robe around him, a purple robe, which was a color of royalty in a way of mocking him. And they put this thorn of, a thorn of crowns on his head about inch and a half to two inches long. And they pressed it on his bra, piercing him. Think about it. Isaiah 53 tells us that they yanked his beard off. You know, um, I've, I've done that before. Have you just kind of go like this a little bit? If you have a beard, just try it. Just go a little bit. It hurts. If you're a woman, you have a beard. Keep waxing. But you know what I'm saying. It hurts. And yet the Lord, think about it, with his long beard, the Roman soldier would grab his hand, grab the beard, wrap, wrap it around his hands as much as he can, and then yank it. Think about it. Yank it. So you can picture the Lord. In fact, the Bible tells us that the way he looked, you can even recognize him. So there he is, bleeding with the crown of thorns. Patches on his beard because it was yanked. Red spots bleeding. And they're laughing at him as they hit him with a little, little beard. That's crazy, man. It's crazy. Because he loves us. And then to top it off, they gave him a 300-pound a cross. Or, or, or maybe a 200-something beam that he carried. There's still a debate how, how it was. Some believe it was a beam. It was a heavy beam. And they made him go up these rocky roads from Jerusalem to Gargotha, which is right outside the, the old city gates. They didn't have the roads like we have outside of our, of, of our church here, on our streets. They were rock. So, and, and, and the Bible records how many times he fell. So picture this. As he fell to the ground... And the, and the weight of the cross pushed him down to the ground as the rocks, the loose rock, will, 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 will stab his knees, will, just, will, will embed into his knees while they're still hitting him. Man, see, see why I couldn't rush through these verses? And then he gets up, they take him up the hill, they lay him down on the beam, and they grab these three inches, three inch net long spikes and they put it right here not here 
People believe it was here, but it couldn't because if it was, the weight of the body would have ripped right through. So it's believed that it's, uh, this, this part of the hand was actually the wrist and, and the rest was, was considered the hand. And right here, there's a little spot where a nail can fit right in there. So they put him up on that cross. I want you to think about this. Once he goes up, gravity takes over. He drops, yet he's hanging by these nails. Do you imagine the agony and the pain? And it's crazy. When you look at the cross, now you see him that he's all straight, but he was actually in a U shape. And he had a little stool at the bottom of the cross where he would lay his feet, where he was nailed to. Think about it. The pain the, of those nails. And he was trying to use it just to pick himself up so he can get some breath in his lungs because he was suffocating. That was the whole intention of crucifixion, that he may suffocate up there. So he'll try and trying to muster all the strength that he can just to get himself up to get some air. Once he does it, uh, he'll fall back down. Yeah, the, just, just his body will just fall right back down. Think about it. So when Jesus is talking about this, let's not forget that he's predicting his own death. And yet he's going to the cross. Not only did he suffer the pain of the cross, the physical part, but also the emotional part, and the spiritual part. He looks down, and all his guys are gone, but one. And then he cries out, Father, Father, why have thou forsaken me? He suffered, man. He, he, he suffered everything, man, so that we won't have to suffer. It's interesting to note that when referring to Christ's sufferings before and during his crucifixion, the New Testament always uses the plural sense. You can read for yourself. They'll have the scriptures up there. 2 Corinthians 1.5, Philippians 3.10, Hebrews 2.10. You can jot them down. They're up there in the, the monitor. You see, his pain wasn't one-dimensional, but, but involved sufferings of many sorts. You can read Isaiah 53. Read the whole chapter. Because of love. He did it. Dude, think about it. And then he says, the last prediction, notice. But in the third day, he will rise again. Contrary to what his disciples and his enemies thought, Jesus' death was in the end. The Father would never allow his Holy One to see corruption according to Psalm 6010. And that's why on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. Never again to face death again. He died to conquer sin and its penalty, which is death. He died that those who believe in him will never have to die. So what we see here is kind of like what I told you in the beginning of my message. Instrument of life. So Jesus took the cross, an instrument of death, and turned it into an instrument of life. I read a story that one commentator noted that I want to read to you by the name of Menelik II, who was the emperor of Ethiopia from 1889 to 1913. He heard that in Europe and America, criminals were executed with an efficient new device called the electric chair. He immediately ordered one of his one for his country and was excited when it arrived <laughs> until he realized it needed electricity. There was no electricity in Ethiopia at that time. So undaunted, he said, if the electric chair can be used for the execution of criminals, <laughs> It will be used for the execution of my commands. So, from that point on, 15 years, Menelik II sat in his electric chair when he issued his proclamations. And he turned his electric chair to his throne, into his throne. The cross 
was an instrument of death. And yet Jesus turned it into, quote, the pinnacle of power where he transformed shame into salvation, rejection into redemption, and grief into glory. Crazy, huh? He took an instrument of death and made it an instrument of life. And can I finish with this, guys? All because of love. So if you're sitting here today and you're saying, how can I live a holy life? Go back to the cross. Let the cross motivate you. Let the cross pump you up, man. Let the cross be the means That's why I, I, I do what I do. I do. I, I'm being honest with you. That's why I do what I do. I do it because I love him. I do it because I said, if Jesus can do that knowingly, Lord, help me to love him, at least to some extent, where I can remain faithful. And you know, one of my prayers when I pray, I, 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 tell, I tell God to give me two things. Number one, to fill me with the Holy Spirit. And the second thing I ask, Lord, fill me with love, your love, so that I can remain faithful. Guys, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's why I felt this, 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 these three verses were so important and I couldn't go keep going right by. And I hope, like Jesus when he pulled his disciples aside away from distraction and reminded them, reminding, reminded them of God's plans, he was also reminding them of his love for them. May you too be reminded of God's love.